I'm currently doing a series of videos um, called Atheism versus India Revisited, and I'm beginning to deal with the issue of Tantra, which is the more esoteric, mystical, I would say actually experiential version of Eastern philosophies. What I would call it is, it's the practice as opposed to the theory behind everything. You can study everything all you want, but um, for it to actually do anything or to mean anything, I believe it is best practiced. Um, what is it in our civilization that recoils from this kind of thing? Um, for the longest time, there was a huge gulf between Eastern Orthodoxy, Christian Eastern Orthodoxy, and Catholicism. And one of the things that the Catholic Western Church had against the Orthodox Church, for um, legitimately or not, I'll put it this way, it's just this is what was said to be the issue, was this idea that the Eastern Orthodox were obsessed with mysticism, with um, things like... Um, trying to look God directly in the face, um, trying to experience God with strange ceremonies, clouds of incense, um, hesychastic breathing exercises, things like this, just direct experience of, I won't say the supernatural, but direct experience of that which is not readily apparent to everybody. Um, that, to the Western mind, is something suspect. And I think this is a very old thread in our civilization, I, um, especially in the West. The sort of revulsion that a lot of people in the West traditionally felt uh, when confronted with Eastern Christianity, I think, is based in large part on a revulsion with religious mysticism. Anything that looks esoteric, anything that looks unconventional, I think, in terms of um, metaphysics, in terms of cosmology or whatever, we recoil from. Um, that is an old thing in our Western culture. Um, if you look at, say, the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, where they're dealing with... Um, people who are offering or attempting to offer other religions to the ancient Israelites. Um, in this case, Id idol worship, I guess, or whatever that happens to be uh, referring to. Idol worship is kind of a pejorative. Um, I'm just going to read this passage from the book of Deuteronomy to show, I think, something that is kind of an undercurrent and a powerful one in Western thinking. Uh, Deuteronomy 13, it deals with worshipping other gods. Um, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place, in other words, even if it's true, <laughs> and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him, serve him, and hold fast to him. Um, it's pretty uncompromising stuff. Uh, basically says, I don't care what arguments these people make. I don't care if they're... Um, if what they say is nuanced. I don't care if they try to explain to you why they're doing what they're doing. Don't even listen. Uh, the Islamic word haram comes to mind, if you ask me. It's just something that is completely forbidden. You must not do this. Um, and you must not even think about why. You just don't do it, because I said so. Um, that prophet or dreamer must be put to death. 
for inciting rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. That prophet or dreamer tried to turn you from the way the Lord your God commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. If your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you, saying, Let us go and worship other gods, gods that neither of you nor your ancestors have known, gods of the peoples around you, whether near or far, from the end of the land or the other, do not yield to them or listen to them. Show them no pity. Do not spare them or shield them. You must certainly put them to death. Your hand must be the first in putting them to death and then the hands of all people. Stone them to death because they tried to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid, and no one among you will do such an evil thing again. <sighs> what is this obsession with anything unconventional? with anything um, nuanced, with anything that might be um, might be a menace to the actual established way of thinking. I think that this is ancient in our civilization, and I think it's particularly pronounced in the modern West, in the scientific way of seeing the world. There is hard science, and anything else is... It's not usually called haram anymore, but they'll say it's bullshit. As though there is something, some category that we can put things that are automatically, they, they qualify automatically as bullshit. <laughs> the only thing that I can find that is bullshit is something that is deliberately offered that is not um, actually cleaved to. In other words, if I try to sell you an idea that I myself don't believe, that's bullshit. <laughs> what if I try to explain and not even offer a point of view um, that I do actually subscribe to, or that at least I take seriously? That's not bullshit. That's not an attempt at deliberately deluding anybody. Um, and this gets me back to the issue that I'm talking about uh, in the run-up to this little mini-series I'm going to do on Tantra within another mini-series, um, where the things that get explored in Tantra uh, <laughs> are likely to come across to a lot of people as bullshit. <laughs> um, people are likely to have the same response as is described in Deuteronomy. I'm as guilty of this as anybody else is. Um, you have no idea how skeptical I am and how deeply I mistrust anything anybody ever says about anything. <laughs> um, I'm willing to take on hard science. That's how skeptical I am. But when you're dealing with the experiential which I think is what is actually being denounced here in Deuteronomy, and again is the old Western Catholic view of Eastern Orthodoxy, or one could even say anything Eastern, groveling before a deity or an idol. Um, Hinduism and the, uh, the reaction of, I can imagine, a 19th century Methodist preacher on arriving in India, he would simply say, oh my God, this land belongs to Satan because he doesn't understand his entire view of faith and religion is radically different from the Indians. The Indians are going for the experience, or at least some of them. The Indians are not going for a universal truth. Now, this, this is a gross generalization to say that the Indians all think a certain way. Um, there are plenty of schools of Indian thought that say, no, no, we found the right way for everybody to live on earth. Um, say the Hare Krishnas, they come to mind. They're like that. They say, there's no other truth to this universe than Krishna consciousness. And sooner or later, it'll rule the galaxy or whatever. I don't know. 
Uh, so no, India is not innocent of this kind of thing. But what I'm saying is, what I'm trying to refer to is the revulsion that people might automatically feel when you start to look into things like Tantra. I can understand that because that's the way the Western mind is put together. It's kind of the, um, the medieval revulsion with anything left-handed, as they say. Saying that maybe there is something to be learned from Satan. Or maybe there is some wisdom in looking into the existence of ideas like Satan. If you look at, um, if you look at uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, he skates very close to that as well. Um, this is, you know, medieval Italy, right at the height of the Middle Ages, Catholic neuroses at its highest. And here he is saying that maybe Satan is actually a victim. <laughs> That's the Divine Comedy. That's the Inferno. Satan is a prisoner in hell. He's not the king of hell. He's the most imprisoned soul in there. Um, poor Satan. <laughs> that's, the, that's the implication in Dante's Divine Comedy, and then that kind of thing gets you denounced. It, it led eventually to him denouncing his own Divine Comedy. Um, although I may have him wrong, it might have been Boccaccio's Decameron, but Boccaccio did the same thing. He said maybe, just maybe, if you read the stories a certain way, maybe Job was a wonderful guy, and God was sinning by persecuting Job. Oh my God, we can't think about that. Block your ears, don't think about it. Haram, haram, haram. <laughs> um, this habit has deep roots in our minds. Um, to the point where I think that our minds shut off when we encounter anything that some part of us says, bullshit, <laughs> or haram. <laughs> um... I've often said a closed mind is a closed mind. Now, I rarely talk about my own, I won't say beliefs, but my own interests on YouTube, at least in this way. And this is some, this series is something of an opening up for me. Um, I'm into Tantra, but I don't do anything stranger than meditate and do Qigong or Tai Chi. Um, and just think a lot about everything, uh, attempting to learn something from the thinking itself, from the experience of exploring my inner life. Um, Tantra deals with that. It deals with your actual experiences, not, your, not what's actually happening in the outside world, although Tantra actually deals with that as well. Indian science is deeply tantric. And I mean hard science, Indian hard science, like astronomy and things like that. But what I'm talking about is what actually goes on in here. There's a reason why the, my avatar is, picture me doing this. What is that inner life? What does that mean to have an inner life? To feel your body from the inside, to experience your mind from the inside and to watch what is happening in here. Um, you manipulate your body in a certain way and certain things happen. I'm currently uh, at 50 learning to sit on my haunches. In other words, you just sit straight down on your heels, Japanese style, I suppose. It's bloody hard. But after a while, um, I'm learning that a strange sensation takes place on the front of the shins. And I'm trying to identify what that sensation is. It's not pain, but I can't hold it in that position for a long time. I can't hold my shins that way because the, the feeling is too intense, but it's not pain. It's a strangely almost ecstatic feeling, but I still, I can't hold it for very long. And even though it's not an agony, it's not a sharp pain that you get when you overstretch a muscle. It's a strange feeling of energy there. I think anyone who is, a, you know, you can try this right now. If you're, you know, I've ever had difficulty sitting on your haunches, just do that and move around a bit and you'll feel that there are sensations in there. You, you might feel pain, you, but you'll also feel other feelings in there. That's neither pain nor pleasure, but it's intense and you're not sure what it is and you can't hold yourself in that position. What is that feeling? <laughs> um, not 
explain that feeling from the outside. What is that feeling from the inside? Qualia, <laughs> um, I guess. What is the feeling, I'm, one could also say, of an orgasm? How do you explain that? But we know what it is, but we can't explain it. Because it's something one must experience. This is almost the second sort of qualification I've placed on my delving into Tantra and the way I'm going to try to explain it. And again, it's kind of a little close to the home for, close to home for me. Um, Mystic of the Sands once asked me a while back, what do you think, Andy? And he's probably my favorite YouTuber out there to deal with right now, um, although there's a few people cl close to top of the list. Um, and he also understood that I would be hesitant to say anything. Because when you're dealing with things like this, it is so easy to be taken out of context or misunderstood. Even in India, the tantrics generally are secretive, and the more, I don't know if you'd say the more advanced or the more adept tantrics, um, are almost... Uh, incognito in Indian society. They just don't want anyone else to know that they're doing this. When you read Deuteronomy, I'm sure there's a way of thinking like that in India as well. As I said, in India, Tantra is vaguely disreputable, and um, the normal Indian reaction to when you mention Tantra will be the same to, say, if you went into a, a very middle-class suburban synagogue in Chicago and said, let's talk about Kabbalah. <laughs> uh, most Jewish people would just go, oh, <laughs> no, thank you. Um, do that in the 19th century and you might get rocks thrown at you in the very same uh, synagogue. It's just all traditions have a fear of the unorthodox. Um, all traditions... Um, all traditions essentially don't like um, anything heterodox, I guess. That goes for science as well. That goes for hard materialism as well. Tantra has that effect on people. I'm profoundly hesitant to delve into this, but I'm tempted. If I end up looking like a complete fool, it's all your fault, mystic. <laughs> Here goes. 